Okay, check this out. The object of this game is simple. You're a basketball player, you have 48 minutes plus maybe some overtime to attempt as many shots behind this three point line as you can before time runs out. But if you don't pace yourself or you don't get enough of your shots into the basket, you might irritate these other four players or your coach or your fans and get yourself stuck on the bench. Three point chucking is one of so many little games you can find between the winning and losing of sports. And with so many volume shooters running around the NBA these days, we've seen some incredible high scores set in this particular game. But long before guys like James Harden and the Splash Brothers made three point barrages a regular event, before playing this game was even possible within NBA basketball, the weirder and more experimental ABA awarded three points for an outside shot. And when it came to threes, you better believe the ABA had guys who chased high scores. There aren't many good definitive stats from this era, but there are some bananas anecdotes, like reports of Tony Jackson attempting 12 threes in a half in 1962 and making 10 of them. But the ABA's real king of threes was this little cutie, Louis Dampier. Dampier is on record attempting over 2,200 threes in his ABA career, including a number of games with double digit takes from behind the line. He was nice too. Look at this gorgeous form, this gooseneck follow through. That crisp shot went in 36% of the time over Dampier's ABA career. The NBA acquired the ABA in a 1976 merger and adopted its three point line starting with the 1979 1980 season. That was Larry Bird's rookie year, and the future three point champ had a couple nights that season putting up five, six, or even seven threes in a game. But the guys who really leaned into the rule change were those who were used to it from the ABA. In 1981, former ABAer Joe Hassett became the first player on record to shoot 10 three-pointers in a game, doing so a couple times, including one night in which he only hit three of the 10. Shout out to Joe Hassett. Aging superstar and former ABAer Rick Barry is supposed to have attempted 10 threes the night he set a record with eight makes. That's an unofficial stat because attempts weren't tracked in the box score that night, and I don't respect it anyway, because Rick Barry refused to shoot his threes underhand like he shot his free throws. Anyway, to find official high scores that stuck for a while, we need to visit a chucking hotbed, Denver, Colorado. On January 9th, 1982, John Roche came off the bench for the Denver Nuggets to fire 13 three-pointers in just 26 minutes. He hit eight of them, including seven and a half. All of this happened in a blowout loss. Delicious. This is not a coincidence. The Nuggets are a former ABA franchise, and in the 80s, they were coached by a former ABA player, Doug Moe, who brought that league's reckless flair with him to the NBA. Moe basically never called plays. He barely made his team practice. Moe's system was known as the passing game. Players ran and shot and passed and ran and shot some more, hardly pausing to play defense and counting on the thin Denver air to ensure their tired opponents couldn't defend them much either. Or, to quote Moe, the passing game is basically doing whatever the hell you want. Moe's Nuggets once scored 184 points in a game, but surrendered 186 to the Pistons. Doug Moe kicks ass. And the guy who broke Roche's high score for three-point chucking was basically the quintessential Doug Moe Denver Nugget. Michael Adams wasn't really anyone. The 5'10 point guard fell to the third round of the 1985 NBA draft, then spent time bopping around leagues like the CBA and USBL before he landed with the Nuggets. In Denver, Adams found a real role and the green light to let his extremely weird jumper fly. Adams had this one-handed push shot that looked kind of like a teardrop floater, but he used it for everything from free throws to three-pointers. Once Adams became a nugget, he released it constantly, averaging almost five three-point attempts a night. And he typically justified his volume with accuracy, like the time in 1989 when he attempted 12 threes and hit eight, including seven in the first half alone. But we're not here to talk about averages or typical games. We're here to talk about extremes. And Adams really let loose on March 14th, 1988. He attempted 15 three-pointers, hitting five in a loss to John Stockton and the Utah Jazz. On the very same day Adams set that high score for threes in a game, over a thousand miles away in Ohio, another great shooter named Del Curry and his wife Sonia brought a son into the world, little baby Stefan. That is just too marvelous to be a coincidence. I know a prophet when I see one. Anyway, as the 80s turned into the 90s, players like Adams had pushed the three-pointer far enough into the mainstream that others felt like they had license to chuck now and then. 
Dudes like Vernon Maxwell, who often took a bunch of three-pointers for legendary Houston Rockets teams that would go on to win championships. Or like Dale Ellis, who became an all-star with the three-pointer as his weapon of choice. In 1990, Ellis actually set a record with nine three-point makes in a game, but he did it extremely efficiently on just 11 attempts. Very impressive. But that's not the game, Dale! Only one man from this era had the nerve to beat Michael Adams' high score in the game of attempting threes whether or not they win it. Michael Adams. In 1990, the Nuggets parted ways with Coach Mo and replaced him with Paul Westhead. They played even faster than before, but they sucked. By April of 91, the Nuggets had long since figured out they were garbage. Winning just 20 games would get them the lottery pick that became Dikembe Mutombo. While playing out the string, Adams figured he might as well shoot for a record number of threes. On April 12, 1991, Adams was only able to tie Dale Ellis' record of nine makes, but he obliterated his own high score to get there, attempting 20 three-pointers. That nothing-to-lose-might-as-well-shoot logic resurfaced with another team a couple years later. During a brief era in which the three-point line was a bit shorter, Coach Dick Mata's 1996 Dallas Mavericks crumbled. They were badly hurt and their stars hated each other. With no hope of winning and intrigued by the foreshortened three-point line, Mata tried something revolutionary, playing small ball long before it was cool. Jason Kidd ran point, the center was 6'9 Lorenzo Williams, and everyone else in the lineup was a wing player compelled to shoot and shoot. Mata's Mavericks absolutely destroyed team three-point records, including a single-game output of 49 threes against the Nets on March 5, 1996. That record would stand for over 20 years. But Dallas's most prolific individual shooter, George McLeod, couldn't quite crack the high score that night, tying Michael Adams' mark with 20 attempts. And 20 remained the high score for a whole nother decade, even as the record for individual three-point makes got broken. Kobe Bryant hit 12 three-pointers in a game in January of 03, but did so on only 18 attempts. You might call that efficient. I call it a waste. You're hot. Shoot more than 18 threes, coward. No, for someone to break Adam's record of 20 three-point attempts, it would take another bad team of despondent players mailing in a meaningless late-season game. Specifically, it would take the Golden State Warriors versus the Portland Trailblazers on April 15, 2005. What an occasion. Both teams sucked. The Warriors won the game by 20 points and did so while attempting 32 three-pointers, a strategy coach Mike Montgomery described as, we thought we'd shoot some threes. Portland shot even more, 37 in a losing effort. The two teams combined for an NBA record 69 three-point attempts. The Blazers barely had a coach at this point. They'd fired Maurice Cheeks in March and let their director of player personnel, Kevin Pritchard, replace him as interim. And the Blazers were so badly injured that night that Reuben Patterson, who'd recently demanded a trade, was forced to participate simply so Portland could field the minimum active roster of eight players. But the real hero in the losing effort was Damon Stoudemire. The diminutive point guard had to play all 48 minutes, and in that time, he unwittingly set a new high score, attempting 21 three-pointers even though he was ice cold. Stoudemire hit only five of those 21 attempts. That's the kind of performance you can only produce on a garbage team wrapping up a forsaken season with only eight healthy bodies and a non-coach as coach. Does that freedom to heave feel good? Well, asked about his achievement following the loss, Stoudemire reportedly shrugged in surprise and said, you're on the floor long enough and that's just gonna start bouncing your way. He makes it sound kind of tedious. It's like when mom and dad have tickets to see Lord of the Dance and they leave you alone for the night and you eat a whole cake for dinner. The freedom's fun for a little bit, but you just end up feeling sick. But some people always eat cake for dinner. If meaningless April basketball is the perfect petri dish for three-point high scores, then J.R. Smith might just be the perfect organism to culture in that dish. Smith played his formative years in Denver and surpassed Michael Adams' record for three-pointers made in a Nugget uniform. And this was during a much slower-paced era with a much less player-friendly Nuggets coach. George Carl, who repeatedly benched JR for his shot selection. So JR wouldn't fulfill his high score potential until later, when he was on the Knicks. Not his first full season as a Knick, in which a team coached by Mike Woodson of all people inexplicably shattered team three-point records and won a playoff series. No, we're talking about the following year, when the Knicks traded for Andrea Bargnani on purpose and completely fell apart. Smith's unrepentant shooting wasn't as cute on a struggling team, but you couldn't tell him that. In December 2013, he attempted 17 threes in a double OT game against the Bucks. He sounded downright amazed with himself and promised he'd do it again if given the chance. 
By April, JR finally had that chance, his opportunity to hop on the sticks and top the charts of his favorite one-player game. LeBron James and the finals-bound Miami Heat kicked the crap out of the lottery-bound Knicks, but they couldn't keep JR down. Smith attempted 22 three-pointers, and this on a night when no other Nick attempted more than 17 shots from any range. JR insisted he didn't intend to break Damon Stoudemire's decade-old record that he just shot because he was open. But I don't know, I look at these four attempts in the final two minutes and I see a man who knows it's April, his team is bad, and he can probably get away with a high score campaign. Well done, JR. Smith's record wouldn't last that long because the three-pointer was taking over and not just in the NBA. Even though WNBA games are only 40 minutes, Diana Taurasi had multiple nights in the mid-2000s attempting 15 threes. She reached 16 in a triple overtime game in 2006. A decade later, Christy Tolliver matched that high score with an even greater performance. Tolliver made her name as a shooting legend early in her career. As a freshman at Maryland, she buried the three-pointer that sent the 2006 NCAA Final to overtime, making her the hero of the Terps' first championship. Eleven years later, Tolliver's Washington Mystics played a single elimination playoff game in New York against the Superior Liberty and Tolliver let loose. She matched the high score Tarasi set in Triple OT with 16 threes in regulation and hit a record nine of them in the process. Thanks to Tolliver's shooting, Washington came back from a big early deficit and took the game by a wide margin. Setting your high score in the context of an elimination playoff game is a far cry from the vain, nihilist, mid-April shot fests of those early NBA record setters. And indeed, three-point chucking doesn't only belong to carefree players representing broken franchises. That kid born the day of Michael Adams' first high score turned into a multiple-time MVP and champion, all while making unprecedented amounts of threes. I specify making threes because Stephen Curry is crazy accurate from every range, and he doesn't need a lot of tries to achieve a lot of makes. Not the case for James Harden, who is merely good in terms of three-point accuracy, but has unparalleled freedom to fling him up. This is a guy who once shot one of 17 from downtown in a game, setting the high score for most three-pointers missed in one night. It helps to be coached by Mike D'Antoni, a man who once coached in Denver and before that played on a 1977 Spurs team coached by Doug Moe. But as we speak, Harden does not hold the high score. On October 29th, 2018, the Warriors crushed the Bulls in Chicago. It was such a blowout that Klay Thompson only played 27 minutes. But in that time, Clay produced 24 three-point attempts, with 14 dropping through the net. Nearly one three-point shot a minute looks as ridiculous in practice as it does on paper. Clay barely dribbled the ball to get these shots off. He mostly ran around screens or scurried into slivers of open space to catch and shoot, in instances like this one barely even facing the rim before he released. This is something totally different from heaving a couple dozen threes in the final stretch of a lost season. The Warriors, like Harden's Rockets, are a powerhouse built on brazen shot selection. One guy going wild and setting a high score isn't a bug, it's a feature of an offensive system built to generate such looks. The computer game has been baked into the actual team basketball strategy. The game of shooting as many threes as possible has come a long way, from the domain of ABA holdovers, to the funky nuggets of the 80s, to the boom of three-point specialists, to depressing, carefree April basketball to today. Thanks in some part to these people and the circumstances that let them run wild, the game blends right into the sport. Keep these heroes in mind the next time a confident shooter with a green light sets a new high score. If you liked episode one of High Score, maybe you'd like to watch this as well. Or if you'd rather see some more vintage J.R. Smith, check out this episode of Rewinder. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and print out our YouTube page and mail it to your friends.